Dzień dobry Państwu, witam Państwa po pokazie kolejnego bloku filmów krótkometrażowych na 61. festiwalu filmowym w Krakowie. W Krakowie offline i online. Zazdrościmy tym Państwa, którzy są na miejscu, a, a my się widzimy wirtualnie właśnie z twórcami konkursowych filmów krótkometrażowych. So I'm so glad that you are, well, you are here, that's not precise to say, but oh, Katarina just joined. Mm. So I'm so glad that we can speak even in this way. And if I may just ask you just to say, well, just to introduce yourself and, and say which film have you made? Film you uh, да, привет, Hi, my name is Arhan. His uh, name is Arhan. Uh, he says hi. <laughs> He's the director of the movie You Are Here. Yes. It's the first serious material that he made, the, uh, the acting serious material that he made. And I'll be asking you about it, but just now, maybe just the name and, and, and the film. Okay, sorry. No, no. Okay. Okay. All right. Orhan. So... Oh. My name is Orhan. Okay. My name is Carol. <laughs> Carol. And here we have Katarina. We don't see you, Katarina. We hope to At see you moment. later. I... And Katarina is the director Hello. of film The Last Matador. Hey, nice to see you. Hey, uh, greetings nice from hey. Turkey. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello. Here, can we go on? Sure. Any like what? Any questions? Should should he so say? We, no, no. Should one he moment. Talk about the the movie. We, we have also one moment. We have also uh, Brindus Anastasia with us and uh, Annabella Stirin. I hope I do not mispronounce your names. Uh, the co a little bit. Then sorry. Uh, the uh, co-directors of. Uh, a film uh, Mouse Ice Cream and uh, Daniel Gray, Daniel Gray, who's uh, professionally prepared and has the uh, poster of his film in his back. Sally taped to the kitchen door. <laughs> so let may, let may I start with uh, with the authors of animations, because uh, I believe, as I imagine, the character of your work and of animation, full of uh, well, it's very hard demanding, time consuming and solitude work. So I'm wondering, have you noticed that we have an epidemic here? Yes, I made the last matador during the Prague lockdown and all the shops were closed, including the timberware and the hardware shop. So we were tearing down the entire furniture of our studio. We were using doors and old, old, old chairs and everything, every, every wooden piece was usable for scenography. <laughs> I see Daniel. Um, we are, I actually got it animated just before the lockdowns happened, so we were quite lucky with that. And then uh, all the comping and stuff was done by me when everything was locked down, so we managed to just about miss, miss it as a problem for visual production. Uh, audio though it messed it up we couldn't get actors into recording studios or mm. or things like that so it that was that was our biggest problem which is quite interesting to me because i really wanted to start with your film because uh, it seems to me that it's ideal for lockdown times because you portrayed the, i mean you showed isolation you showed people only in their houses uh it really feels like film that uh, suits the time we were living in. Yeah, that was kind of good luck, bad luck, or bad luck, good luck. It was, um, when I made the film, I think it was uh, quite a small audience of people who would appreciate what I was trying to sort of, uh, the feelings I was trying to manifest in an audience. And then 
all of a sudden it was a very common feeling of this isolation and uh, being cut off from, you know, your your loved ones. You weren't allowed to go to parents for hugs and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, it, it became um, a broader audience during the pand pandemic. So, you know. Claustrophobic atmosphere also. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's... Uh, Especially a, a cupboard becoming that kind of living space is is very true for a lot of people now. Or, well, yeah, the apartment, no garden. <laughs> but also, you just, you decided. I mean, the, the the well, the plot. I mean, the 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 idea of your film. It's it's all in a way child play, hide and seek. I'm wondering, is it also because uh, you are portraying a child who's in a way losing his innocence, looking how. Uh, watching how uh, the mundane life and the whole life actually looks like. Well, the uh, the way I try, well, the way I write is very non-literal normally. So, what I was trying to do with the film was um, sort of convey this feeling I have of of like homesickness, and I wanted to do that by um, what modern homesickness is is this feeling that you get all the information you see what's happening you you talk to everyone and stuff but there's something missing which which is quite hard to describe you know the olden days you'd olden days you'd send a letter and then three weeks later you get the reply and that that was homesickness very easy but now it's uh, a certain something which is hard to, it's like a paper cut it's hard to put your sort of finger on and i wanted to uh talk about that feeling of disconnection and of um oh what would the other word be but i'll talk about this feeling of disconnection and try and get this uh feeling in an audience uh the it starts off as sort of child's play and hide and seek because that was a really nice device where you could start the game wanting to win and hiding really well and as the game goes on he his pride sort of takes over to stay in there, to continue to win. And then that's kind of forgotten. And uh, as the sort of reality of the situation sort of unfolds in front of him. Um, so yeah, it's kind of that. And, and watching his close ones, like for the, like for the glass door, I mean, through the glass uh, window, and which is, I guess, now, nowadays also very, I would say modern, because we all communicate mostly through social media and communicators like this. And I'm yeah. very glad that you're all here, but I would prefer you to be in Krakow. <laughs> so it's also your commentary on, well, social media? Well, it was uh, not, not specifically social media because I'm talking about FaceTime and Skype and stuff. It's more about edited highlights of life. So when I spoke to my parents, um, they don't talk about the bad or the mundane and stuff. You get all the good news, all the positives, and you just get that. So you don't actually get anything of, of their actual life, really. You just get this. And that happens over social media, definitely. But it also happens in, in conversations where you only have like five minutes or where you want the other person to feel good about uh, your own situation and stuff, you know, it's uh, empathy get turbo. <laughs> but still, there's this uh, mm, this painful this painful view how well how people apart from each other how relations break. That's your diagnosis, also of well modern. Yeah, problems. well, it's the the longer the the person's in the cupboard, the less of the world he came from exists. You know. Um, so you know stuff stuff which was home in there dis disappears bit by bit until the cupboard isn't doesn't really exist because there's no home there's nothing left of the outside world and it was um it's weird because when i i wrote it before this lockdown but i wrote it kind of like um a little bit of guilt a little bit of um what if with my own sort of family situation and then um, it became a more literal tale as the production came sort of carried on because my mum got ill and she passed away a few months ago. And now it's like my dad's on his own and with, with my sister and stuff. But so as we made the film, it became less a what if and more uh, 
sort of uh, what's happening. So it, it made it very uh, difficult in parts to make. Did it did it have any healing impact or? Yeah. Well, it was weird because when I started it, I was sort of preempting these feelings. I was trying to sort of uh, digest them, and at the end, the way I finished it is the way I feel about it. It's not really resolved, so it was good, but it was also I I expected it to be something to work through the feelings before the feelings happened, and then all of a sudden the feelings, everything starts happening. So it was. It became a different film emotionally for me to make. I guess it's also important that, uh, I mean, it's in a way symbolic that this film goes back to the childhood and, but also, but also in a technique in a world where uh, there's a lot of Pixar animation and all the computer animation and 3D generated and all, all of this. You, mix, you made something which resembles exactly childish painting um that's just how i draw <laughs> no no uh, <laughs> it was i said it with appreciation <laughs> no um yeah i kind of like to be as honest as possible with the way uh i present the image and stuff so um that kind of uh you know the analog look and stuff to me feels like something an audience can sit down and uh, accept what you're saying uh, as as a truthful statement um and then within that i try and be more complicated with my my uh framing and the way i form space and 3d which i guess uh, in terms of this uh, older techniques i mean older old school technique but but still very much alive i guess katarina would uh, uh i guess you would uh, also agree and be a defender of uh, this uh you can call it traditional, but very powerful animation. May I ask you about your technique? I'm using the very classic Czech school animation. And the very important thing is that all my puppets are handmade. And we are not using lip sync nor moving eyes. Our facial expressions are more keen to the puppet theater aesthetics. So and I think that's something new. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned Czech school. I mean, you have been. I mean, you, you used to live in in Czech Republic uh, during the, the 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 times of regime. I'm wondering, is it also why you're interested in the story about dictator a dictatorship? I think so, but also because I have born in Tampere in Finland, and we had the long and cruel civil war. 1918. So I have also made animations about uh, our civil war in Finland. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, but also I guess those subjects nowadays in Europe are still present and... Yes. <laughs> so I guess we don't learn much from history. No. Well, short but very precise answer. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so then I'm wondering, because you send, you are sending actually the dictator in space. So you believe that sometimes, well, the easiest uh, solutions are the best and it's the final <laughs> to put them in life? Yes. And also there is a kind of this kind of metamorphosis or this end when this matador turns out to be a president himself, but he will be a good president. So there is some kind of improvement, maybe a hope. Yeah, because from the beginning you have in this film the melancholy, like uh, this, yes. or, or even more, or even more nostalgia for the times when of values, of different values, of elegance in a way. It was very concrete because I was uh, writing the script in Barcelona. And uh, I was observing the old Corrido Arenas. They are nowadays big and expensive malls, and it looks very surreal and crazy. We have the Prada and Gucci everywhere in the old Corrido spaces. And uh, then it's also the reality that many old school matadors, they are now 
unemployed artists in a way. Mm. I see. And uh, there is a very, uh, you mentioned that uh, they're, they're, your puppets, they obviously don't move lips, but uh, in uh, offline commentary, there is quite, uh, I would say, important sentence that, uh, well, Vladimir Putin has to fight his most uh, difficult enemy himself. So do you believe that behind every dictator, there are, well, some kind of problem, complexes? Traumas maybe, or this kind of unfulfilled dreams. I, I believe so. Mm. Mm. I see, and probably you can say it also about leaders of, of our times now. Well, <laughs> we don't have to look so far. The political situation is very complicated, even in Czech, in my other hometown, Prague. We had very, very strange events recently. We were moving out of some kind of old statues and uh, it's still, how can I say, it's very complicated matter. The history is still present. And I think it takes, takes many, many generations before the shadows are vanishing. Mm -hmm. That happened also in my hometown. My grandchildren are, are nowadays free of the memories of the civil war, but it took five generations. I see. And this is also in a way subject of, of Mao's ice cream. Uh, this history that goes on from generation to generation, or it doesn't. I mean, there is, there is one character in your film which complains that uh, young ones uh, are not interested in history. And uh, well, and it might have important consequences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dusa, yes. Especially they're not interested in uh, maybe developing their critical thinking. I mean, they learn the history, but it's not necessarily um, the whole history, maybe, because under the Communist Party, of course, it, there's one history, but not all of it. And they don't talk to each other. That's the issue, that the generations don't talk to each other about uh, the past, because they really want to forget it. Mm -hmm. Because in your project, uh, mm, well, you portray five friends uh, who are uh, each each de decade making the, the same. I mean, this in this the photo in the same way together. I'm always wondering why did you choose to speak about uh, well five decades of or four decades actually of uh, Chinese history? Why why did you choose such a private lens? Yeah, so it's always hard to decide who's going to take the questions. So we're just going to do one after each other. But I think we chose it because it's very hard to get an insight into China in general. Like, there's not much, there's not many films that actually show, like, the how history and how the whole political situation has an impact on really everyday life people, like these women who are just friends and they're not famous, they don't want to be famous, but they are, have a very special tradition, a very special friendship. And it's very rarely that you actually get insights into, um, yeah, their life and like how their lives have changed so immensely over the, over the uh, 40 years of their friendship. So I think we were really interested to get to know this country um, from like a very personal and private angle and something that you usually don't see, I think. And yeah, especially today, there's not much empathy with, or it's hard to empathize with people from, from other cultures. So I think we wanted to really show like how you can, how this friendship is something that every, a friendship is something everybody knows. And this idea of five women who stay friends over so long is something maybe a lot of people can relate to also from other cultures, other countries. So I think that was our thinking. And then for, for our colleague Jalu, who's actually not here today, unfortunately, she, she can't join. It was also like an own, her own exploration of her family's history or her family's 
of her mother's friendship, basically. So that's why she wanted to. Because you mentioned the universal subject of uh, uh, universal subject of friendship, but there's also the other universal subject, and a lot of artists. Uh, for example, in Poland, there was the painter Romano Pauka. He was for all his life. Uh, I would say counting counting the passing time on his canvas, but there's a lot of projects of people, for example, doing photos every day, every day in the same manner. So I guess this pass this passing of time is another universal subject here. Yes, for sure, passing of time, but also the fact that you can so clearly see the differences the country has been through in the past 40 years, just by looking at the photos and by looking at their faces. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes you see them tired. And if you calculate, you know, maybe at the time they had small children and uh, things like this and how they developed. At that time, maybe in 86, they, 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 didn't, they, they were still like kind of living quite poorly and they didn't have good jobs but then later you see they they are more makeup more fancy you can see like also they're like economically they're progressing as well somehow until now when when we shot the film 2016 they were all almost retired basically and uh, yeah you can see it in the colors you can see it on their faces so it's kind of passing of time through through these five photos as well but also of course there's a, like a political subtext there the fact that uh, they don't always agree on politics and things like that. Uh, I mean, they rarely talk about politics anyway, because women in China are not supposed to talk politics. It's a man's topic. Which is also incredible that that struck me in your film, how, how freely they express their views, which are not necessarily always uh, similar as the official propaganda. Were, weren't they afraid? Uh, did you, did, I mean, because, you know, it's, uh, well, I, I'm sure that you checked if they are well, safe. We had amazing access because our colleague, uh, Jalu, so the main character, one of the main characters is her mother, and she knew all these women all her life, so they trusted her immensely. And uh, no, I think they, ne they were never scared of consequences or things like that. They, they were very... They were very uh, like free. And also, of course, uh, we actually filmed me and Annabella. We filmed most of the film, Jalu wasn't there. So uh, the fact that they knew we don't speak that language, they, it was kind of, it made us invisible. So they just were very, very natural all the time. Um, yeah, so that also helped. But of course, uh, for them, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blessing, this film, because they see it as this, like proof how strong their friendship is and how beautiful it is. And they're really, really happy. And they love to share this with the world and yeah. Yes, but I'm also asking because I, I, I always uh, wonder, for example, the, well, even at those top festivals, uh, like on one hand, for example, Lu Ye had to, had to emigrate from, from China after showing his film in Cannes. And on the other hand, for example, Jia Zhangke or Diao Lian, they are presenting very, I would say controversial from the point of view of government uh, uh, view of China. So that's I'm, that's why I'm wondering how ordinary people, well, somehow uh, slip through censorship and all the regime. I mean, you mean if ordinary people. Um, yeah, are scared of speaking their mind, or what? What exactly. do you mean? I mean, because uh, exactly, yeah, knowing that it is gonna go abroad, that it's gonna be shown um, at the festivals. But I can only speak for the our characters. I I can't speak for other people, and they they were happy to share their opinions. I. Um, and yeah, I mean, we have, a, I think we have quite a balanced view. We have like characters who are, uh, yeah, communist and, uh, party members and they love everything about it. And then we have somebody who maybe is less, uh, yeah, interested in the party, but. And who's saying. I don't think there's extreme views or anything. It's, yeah. it's quite, uh, 
Well, they're saying uh, explicitly that uh, the history from history books is a lie. Yes, coming from a history teacher, that's... <laughs> that's quite strong, I would say. Yeah, um, yeah. Opinion. Uh, well, I mean, true, but... But what surprises you the most is that she shares this or that she has this opinion in the first place. Mm -hmm. like, what? And for working on this film, uh, The Free of Us, uh, uh, oh, sorry, The Free of You, obviously. The Free mm -hmm. of You. Uh, did you... Uh, being from three different countries, uh, 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 as I know, did you have a little bit different perspective on on the regime, on China, on the on the characters? I mean, did you did you see those differences coming from different bang backgrounds? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like for instance, just that Jalu is like from China, and from it is her story mostly. It's her family and her mother and. So she had, she had way more access, she had way more also understanding of little subtle things, whereas me and Vindusha, we were seeing many things that she wouldn't see. So we had like more of a broader view, for instance, we were seeing other details. So I think that was um, quite interesting. And I think Vindusha, maybe you want to share like from from your point of view and from like, coming from also from a yeah i mean post -communist I, I grew country. up uh, in Rom i'm romanian so like i i was taught from an early age how evil communism is in my family and how it can't work and people suffer and that's it and uh, i was very curious to see like we went we were in china for two months we spent time with these uh, ladies and um, i was just very curious to see how it works there and how how happy people are in general like ordinary people, how is their daily lives? How does it look like? And I was just so, it's so different from what could I possibly imagine? Like what my parents told me is just something else. It's not, it's not the same thing. It's, it's, so I had this preconceptions going there and then they were kind of broken making the film like changed. Um, and well, I just I guess also that's different type of communism then, but because uh, of course, yeah, yeah. But uh, also, what I what I liked in the film a lot is that uh, maybe it's because there were three of you from exactly for also from looking at uh, the world from different perspectives, that it's not only about China because I guess uh, the uh, whole part about uh, about critical thinking about uh, well challenging the official truth it's something that might be useful also in Europe yes I mean especially this idea of like talking about the past versus not talking about the past and really like always bringing back what happens or not like for instance I'm from Germany and we have a very different relationship to our history and like in our schools we have a very different idea of how we deal with the past so it was um I think it can also be very interesting for other European um, cities and uh, not city societies on like how, for instance, Chinese people talk or not talk about the past and what kind of consequences that has. Well, on the contrary, for example, to Poland, you deal with history, which is great itself. <laughs> yeah. But and and then I would like to ask uh, Orkan, because uh, your film is, I would say. Uh, among all, all films here, the most, or maybe ex excluding also Daniels, but uh, uh, but uh, it's live action, but also uh, very, I would say, very private. Um, I'm wondering why did you choose in, in, in well, in such a turbulent times, you wanted to make something much more ly lyrical, I would say. Throughout the year, they were looking for the material, for the story. And as soon as they found this story from some of their friends, perhaps they realized, instantly realized it's their story. 
не окружающая конъюнктура, а вот что-то такое сердечное, личное, уютное, чего сейчас мало, что-то... Something cordial, something cozy, something that is uh, very... Uh, sell, you can seldom find it in real life now because of the uh, people's uh, strictness, because of the people's... Um, so, so this is very kind, you would say. Mm -hmm. У меня такое ощущение, что, возможно, возможно, я не прав, но что если бы этот фильм, может быть, вышел бы раньше или значительно позже. Okay. And he has a feeling that if this movie had come out earlier, uh, то, возможно, он бы так не воздействовал. It wouldn't impact people this much. Why? Потому что он... Почему? Ну, потому что... Uh... Такое ощущение, что сейчас uh, кино про uh, катастрофы. Uh, he, uh, he wants to say that movies now are mostly about the catastrophes and problems. Да, они uh, как будто внутренне нам сейчас не нужны. Мы все какой-то инкубаторный сейчас, мы какой-то... He says that people don't need this now uh, because people are now uh, in a new phase of, uh, of thinking. And something cordial, something close to your heart, uh, we lack it. Like people need it because they lack it. That's the answer. That's what what he thinks about that. Because there is this kind of, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I think I thinking stereotypically, but but this kind of yeah. Russian melancholy. Because I don't know. I thought about uh, yeah. the yeah. film. Yeah. I don't know if it's proper international title, but Moscow doesn't believe tears by Menshov or the old melodrama. Moscow Slam не верит. Он он говорит, что российские фильмы они все мелодрамы. Что он приводит пример Москва. Good questions. Не все, но есть фильм "Утомленные солнцем" Михалкова. There is a movie called "Утомленные солнцем" by Nikita Mikhalkov, which is not like this. This is not. Right, exactly. Uh, Thank you very much. I could... But this is, he says, it's also a kind of melancholy. Uh, I think that when you uh, shoot a movie about Soviet aesthetics, uh, people didn't have anything except each other. Because everything was uh, strict and tough. Uh, all, uh, people went through prejudice, through um, limits. Uh, and people's uh, relationships is indeed melancholy. It's happiness for sadness, kind of. I'm glad that you re relate to original Burned by the Sun, not, the, not to, the, to the next uh, sequels of it. I'm glad that you are on the original Utabliony Sun, not on the next one. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes so, uh, and this is this melancholy, and this uh, is this the reason why you also experiment with black and white and color and and, and your uh, formal. Yes. A lot of references in this movie come from Russian classic directors. Uh, Cranes Fly by by Mikhail Latozov. This uh, uh, so these people, these directors were very young at the time they were shooting these movies. 
И до сих пор, даже на нынешнее время, мы не всю их технику и не всю, как сказать, всех технических возможностей мы можем воспроизвести. Это уникальные люди. And we can reproduce their techniques still to this day, because the, the, these directors were unique. И мы хотели к ним потянуться, естественно, и эта картинка, и черно-белая, это самый, и 4 на 3. So we were striving towards this picture, black and white, 3 to 4 Каждый ratio. Каждый палатка, место, альфлаги, все это именно тех лет. Для нас было важно воссоздать эту фактуру. It was important to recreate the picture. So the tents, all the reliquence they used uh, were back from Soviet Union. So I would like to ask all of you actually, because uh, uh, yeah, Orkan said that we don't need films about, about catastrophes now, or, but uh, this is my question, because we're just, well, I hope we're, we're at the end and not in the middle of, uh, of epidemic. And I'm wondering, how do you feel as a filmmaker? So, I mean, when you think about your next projects and projects which somehow would relate to, to the real, well, relate to the reality nowadays, uh, what do you think is important now? What stories would you like to say uh, exactly in this quite new, after this, this thing and in this quite new situation? Uh, the impossible, so love being impossible. Sorry for my personal view. My girlfriend lives in Berlin. And we're in this situation in the middle of lockdown. И весь этот период uh, лезли разные истории, разные концепции, как, uh, на что и наше время похоже. And throughout this period, we have come across some ideas of what this uh, time period looks like, what it is like. Но, к моему сожалению, у меня такое ощущение, что uh, пандемия заканчивается. But unfortunately, it seems that the pandemic is coming to an end. Uh, it feels like a war, uh, some kind of war is emerging. And, and, Annabella Brintus, I'm wondering, because uh, we all worked, uh, you know, all work from home. When you were uh, working the three of you, because uh, probably you were also working on the film during lockdown, no? We edited during lockdown last summer, yes. So did this, did, 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 did this time uh, show that, well, you can make film via Zoom and other We programs? were lucky enough to physically be in the same place. So we edited together uh, physically, all three of us. But, yeah, we were actually supposed to go to Finland for editing. Good. We were, and we, yeah, we were invited to from a from a residency. So we had like Good. we got a residency, and then we were supposed to edit the film in in Finland, but it became a home residency. So that was so. Then we were together with another artist collective, and we kind of organized Zoom screenings and showing each other our work, yes. which was a bit sad, but at the same time it was interesting. Yeah. Which town it was supposed to be in Finland? Uh, it was, the, you know, Sari, the Sari? Yeah, Sari yeah. resident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was... So another time, <laughs> it's very yeah. nice. Hopefully, yeah. But connected to what uh, Orhan said, um, the war, pandemic resembling a war, we're actually planning to, to shoot a film this summer. And um, I think, for us, because our background is also journalism and we're very much interested in also how, what we learned in this pandemic. Uh, we on an individual basis, a societal basis, and um, also how it affected all, all our, everybody, I think their mental health was in one way or another affected by what we've been went through. 
and um, we would like to yeah make a film about like the effects of the pandemic on mental health and kind of because we heard this comparison a lot with war we have a lot of friends from Syria and they compare it with war as well like somehow this idea of isolation of um, insecurity not being in control and things like that and we kind of want to explore like also the long-term effects like even if people come out of the pandemic now or out of the lockdowns or whatever like how it still can affect your mental health in the long term so um yeah that's the, the next project for some action mm -hmm. well, i was thinking uh this we anon questions because uh, in in Prague, but also in Finland, some of even my colleagues started to believe in these QAnon things. And I really tried to understand this, uh, what makes people believe in th this kind of uh, almost like mythological things like uh, Hillary Clinton eating babies. And I really wanted to illustrate that in an animation to try to show it how absurd it is. And, uh, but also it was painful because of some of my really close colleagues started to believe in such things that I could not so any sense. And so it was a bit like a, another kind of civil war experience even. That's true. And though. also this discussion about vaccinations, it was very high in Finland because we still have this, okay, this old, Finnish style, we are living in the woods and we are quite isolated by nature. So this has been a very hot topic in Finland. Yes. But I guess it happens everywhere that people do not believe in experts, but just have their own theories, not on, uh, sorry, not them, but it's Polish word. Uh, all their own theories about, well, vaccines, virus and everything. Yes. And I have no idea where does it come from, do you? No. But Brindusa mentioned quite an important subject about mental health during during this time. Mm. Well, I myself, I mean, my doctor tripled my dose of, of antidepressants. Uh, I guess uh, it's something that surrounds us. I mean, living a year in, in fear, but also seeing so much death, losing close ones. Uh, yes, also. Mm -hmm. Is it something that, for example, Daniel, would you like to work on, on it also in your animation? Will you continue to show, well, how, well, how, how the world, in, how the world uh, changes people and influences their, their exactly mental health, their, their way, of, way of thinking and feeling? Um, uh, so the way, the way I try and write is just from my own experience, but I very much understand that I'm not a, I'm not a, like a special individual who has a unique experience. So I try and think that what I what I'm writing about is is very shared. Um, it's difficult with the pandemic and stuff because for me, it was overshadowed by cancer really and the complications of that as in not being able to go to see someone who's in their final moments was a complication for a lot of people in a pandemic but for me it wasn't coronavirus it was a cancer thing so it's um it it feels it feels like uh something else to me at the moment and that's just through through um uh, chance or whatever uh, for me now, it's like um, the things in my mind are like trying to get home a bit more and home is Wales in the UK. And now they've got like uh, the Indian variant uh, strain of virus. I don't like the way we, we call them the strains after countries and stuff, but that's what it's publicized there. And, um, and that to me now is going back and seeing my dad and stuff and my sister. So to me, it's still, I'm still sort of stuck in the same feeling of, it feels like uh, the one loss, which is being dragged on a bit. So, so I can't, I can't really think about writing anything about 
uh, what the pandemic is or was or no but i'm not be. asking about pandemic i'm asking just oh. about what you feel what you are writing now what you feel now is important. Oh, what i i tend to write in advance a lot i tend to have a lot of ideas so the stuff i have started working on is is sort of pre all this so um i'm in a funny situation where what comes next feels um uh a little bit distant a little bit cloudy mm. i'm doing i'm doing um, a project which is uh a, a sort of an adaptation of a children's book which is good and feels kind of cathartic because it's uh very solid and anchored in something which is uh there already and everything else is a bit cloudy to be honest you know does that make sense <laughs> Absolutely, it does, and it's very touching. And as Annabella wrote, we are so we are sorry for your loss. And mm, but just ending. But also, I would like to ask because obviously, animation and shorts uh, uh, they have difficult, difficult lives. I mean, mostly festival circuit. But I'm wondering if uh, now, when we ha when the whole film business has to, well, reinvent itself. After the after after, mm, I don't want to repeat to this word. So after those this catastrophe, uh, do you think that there is a chance that finally animation or short short films they're gonna be more, well, appreciated, screened more frequently? They will find new ways to distribute. I hope so. Just now we are planning a communal project in a small Finnish town. We are going to create like something like an animation club or animation lounge in the middle of town. So people are really waiting for that because very soon the restrictions are getting easier in Finland. So I think we will have a quite an unusual and very eager audience. People are waiting something to happen, let's say so. Annabella, bring to Sir Daniel something to add to it? Um, no, well, not really, because for I think animation is always going to be sort of a little bit sidelined. <laughs> you go, you go to festivals, and and they treat it sometimes as a genre instead of a technique. You go places where it's seen as a as bookends to the live action, uh, as a sort of you know. Um, I think um, I think we have to just do sort of accept what it is, and then we strive to sort of upstage everyone else by by surprise. We get the element of surprise with a Trojan horse, you know. So let's let's enjoy that. <laughs> and with live action. I can see you do not have much hope in new ways of distribution of short of, of uh, live action short films. So I'm not I'm not, go not going to tire you. But so just ending, I just well I can see we are all a little bit also numb after this after this whole time. So uh, just uh, what was saying Daniel. Let's do our things and uh, let's look for the new hope, as they would say in Star Wars. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Annabella. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you, Bindusa, Orhan, and uh, Kiryu. Yes, Kiryu. Sorry. Yeah. And thank you, Daniel. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you. And thank I you hope much. to meet you sometime on the festival circuit. Hope to see you next time in Krakow. In Krakow. Yeah. Not exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this conference. Good luck, everyone. Good night. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Good luck. Bye bye. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Have a good day.